Hello and welcome. I'm Pastor Mary Beth. This is the Treplo United Methodist Church and this is January 8th, 2023. And we are entering into a time of um, a new script, uh, sermon series. It's a four week conversation about how we can make sense of God's will. So we're gonna start this morning with our scripture reading. We're gonna find it in the book of Genesis in the very first chapter, verses 27 and 28. Hear these words. So God created humans in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. May these words bless us this week. Like I said, we're going to be um, beginning today a four-week conversation about how we can make sense of God's will, especially when God's will doesn't seem to make any sense. And we're gonna start out with a real problem that many of us have about God. And that is, if God is good, then people shouldn't suffer. And if people suffer, that means that God isn't good. So I'm gonna to begin today with one of the worst events that I remember in my lifetime. Some of you are maybe too young to recall uh, the Rwandan genocide of 1994. Those of us who watched in horror will never forget it. Well, a number of years ago, I met a woman named Immaculee Ilibagiza. And when Immaculee was 22 years old, her pastor hid her and five other women behind a wardrobe during the genocide that killed hundreds of thousands of people um, in Rwanda, including Immaculee's parents and her brothers. How could this happen? How could this be the will of God? I want to go backward in time and try and figure some of this out. There were and are several ethnic uh, groups in Rwanda. For our purposes today, we're going to touch on two of them. The Tutsis, who were traditional herders and owned cattle, were considered probably the wealthier. Um, the Hutus, they farmed the earth, and they were considered less well-off. Around 1900, Belgian, colonial, Belgian colonials began to recognize and promote the Tutsis because they were tall and they had um, long necks and straight noses like Europeans. The Tutsis, the Hutus rather, they were shorter and they had flat noses. Well, fast forward to 1990, when the Hutus began to resent this sort of historical inequity, they started to refer to the Tutsis as foreigners, and then traitors, and then snakes, and then cockroaches. It became this national campaign. And finally, uh, the call came to exterminate the Tutsis throughout the country. Machetes were distributed across the nation. Rwanda is 95% Christian. On the Sunday before the terror began, Hutu Sunday school teachers were teaching their Tutsi children that they would later murder. Hutu teachers, um, Tutsi pastors and Hutu congregations, they had fellowship together. And then on April 7th, 1994, Hutus began sweeping across the country, systematically murdering every Tutsi and every Hutu moderate that they could find. In 100 days, 800,000 Tutsis had been hacked to death. Where was God in the midst of this? Now I remember, and maybe you do too, growing up in Sunday school, when we are taught, or at least it is inferred, that if you believe in God, if you're a Christian, then God will protect you. And that works for a while, until life happens to you and you realize that it isn't that simple. Well, it wasn't that simple in the Bible either because in the very second story about Cain and Abel, Cain kills his brother Abel. And it kind of went downhill from there until in the sixth chapter of Genesis, God says that he regrets ever having made human beings. His chosen people, the Israelites, they became slaves in Egypt and endured 400 years of hell on earth. And then in the New Testament, Jesus is perfect and he is tortured and killed on the cross. Where was God? 
In this case, we might be tempted to use that oh so misguided phrase, everything happens for a reason. But tell that to the parents of the 19 children shot to death at their desks in Uvalde, Texas. God had a reason for this? I want no part of that, God. One young mo mother of a nine-year-old who was killed that day said this, the God I believe in doesn't need to shoot children to accomplish his will. And then there's the whole problem and idea of providence, that somehow everything is preset, prearranged in our lives to happen at a certain time for a certain reason that is forever a mystery to us, but that we must accept somehow. Well, if that's the case, then why even wear a seatbelt? Why go to the doctor if it's all prearranged anyway? Why take care of the planet or your children or anything else if everything is already set to happen in a certain way? It doesn't make any sense. Now, earlier I read from Genesis 1 where God declares that we will have dominion over the earth. God provided us with a mind and a heart and a spirit to have some control over everything that he created. We are free, free to choose what we do with that dominion. And if you think about it, humans are very attached to freedom. We are willing to die for it. And dominion and freedom can be a match made in heaven or dominion and freedom can be a match made in hell. On the Korean War Memorial in Washington, D.C., it says freedom isn't free. And isn't this true when we think about some of the poor decisions that we made? Because we were free to make them. A friend of mine has great kids. They're funny, they're kind, they're obedient. They've always pretty much done what they're told, never in trouble. And then when their oldest turned 14, he stopped listening to them. He just stopped. He began to think for himself and he began to resent their direction and their leading. And that was terrifying for them, not just because it was new, but also because he made some really poor decisions. And if you're older than that and you think back to your time right about then, you'll remember that you were probably the same. Once you've discovered the freedom of freedom, there's just no going back. Adam and Eve knew it and we know it too. We all have the capacity to do good and we all have the capacity to do evil. During those 100 days in Rwanda, 200,000 Hutus killed 800,000 Tutsis. Most of the rest of the Hutus in the community, and there were many, remained silent. Dominion misused includes silence. Now some Hutus hid the Tutsis, like Immaculate's pastor who was a Tutu, Hutu. That pastor had been taught to love. We are taught to hate or we are taught to love. I'm a pastor because I believe that the capacity to learn love is the highest power there is. In 1933, Adolf Hitler and his officials began a campaign, campaign to demonize the Jewish people of Germany. First they were called foreigners, and then they were called traitors, and then they were called snakes, and then they were called cockroaches. They needed to be exterminated. 65 million residents of Germany were not Jewish, and most of them remained silent. God can only defeat evil when God's angels on earth, you and me, are willing to defend good. After that SUV dro drove through that parade in Waukesha, Wisconsin, in November, and killing and injuring 68 people, the Watt brothers, JJ and TJ and Derek, all NFL players, responded by offering to contribute a substantial amount of money to a fund to pay for funeral and medical expenses. That's dominion done right. Power and freedom used for good. So I just want to revisit a couple of questions, a couple of things, an answer, answer to the question, why do the innocent suffer? First, dominion gives us or freedom, as we've already talked about, but it also gives us responsibility. God's primary way of serving this whole planet is through people. When something needs to be done, God sends people to do it. When the poor are hungry, God doesn't rain down manna from heaven anymore. God sends someone to feed those people. When someone is sick 
or rep oppressed or hopeless, God sends God's angels on earth to offer relief. Second, to be human is the ability to choose right from wrong. Remember, we talked about freedom. Other mammals are driven by instinct. We are driven by choice to a large degree, from what we put in our mouths to what comes out of them. We get to choose. Thirdly, we all have one thing in common, and that's for sure, and that is our predisposition to stray from God's path. The Hebrew word for sin translates to stray from the path or miss the mark. The path is God's path, and the mark is God's desire for humankind. When the serpent in the Garden of, of Eden um, leads Adam and Eve to make poor decisions, they have missed the mark for God's desire for them, God's hope for them. We all make decisions every single day to follow God's path or the path of the serpent. And when we cho choose the serpent's path, inevitably some part of God's paradise for our life is lost. Now I know that this is longer than most of my sermons, but please stick with me because this, this conversation deserves our full attention. And I want to take a peek at three additional categories of suffering. The first is something that we have certainly seen in the news the past couple of weeks, and that is human suffering as a result of natural disasters. There isn't a whole lot we can do about the weather, but we do, thanks to science, we do know quite a bit about it. For example, earthquakes are the result of the movement of the Earth's plates. If they didn't move around, our planet would overheat from the inside out. It's an amazing feat of engineering because the planet couldn't survive. It couldn't, survive, it couldn't uh, support life without this movement. And monsoons, monsoons are part of the Earth's cooling system. Sadly, humans and creatures get caught in the way of these disasters and these giant forces of nature. We're no longer bound to believe that God does this because we've sinned or that um, God sends earthquakes and floods, uh, floods. And we know that God can't inter intervene in these things or the planet would become inhabitable, uninhabitable. It would ensure the destruction of this planet. Our only choice really is to adapt to these events as best we can, either by avoiding living in these areas prone to the disasters or by engineering systems and governments and buildings that can withstand them. Too often, the terrible destruction occurs, if you think about this, among the poorest among us because they have the least power to make different choices. So next, next let's think about human suffering due to human decisions. Uh, suffering caused by human decisions. And, and we've already touched on this a little bit. Let's call him James. James was angry. He said that his business failed because God helped his business fail. When really pressed for answers, James admitted that his business failed, failed because he hadn't had enough money to advertise properly and um, his customers didn't really even care about the product and he couldn't compete price-wise with bigger companies. When asked what role, role God played in all of this, well, James became silent. What faith in God offered James was the knowledge that despite his business failure, he was never a failure in God's eyes. And finally, we come to something that we all know way too intimately, and that is suffering due to illness. God proves that sickness, I should say Jesus proves, that sickness is not God's way. He healed people. We have amazing bodies um, set up to heal themselves when at all possible. The psalmist in chapter 139 says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And yet, in spite of our best efforts at self-care and regular exams and hearty prayers, we get sick, sometimes seriously, and it makes us angry. It makes me angry. But God understands anger. It's part of grieving, and God certainly understands grieving. Now, throughout the, peop the Bible, when people are hurt by violence and disaster and illness and oppressive government governments, one constant remains. And that is that God never leaves those suffering alone. And for those who either don't notice it, they don't notice God, they don't care about it, 
or they choose to reject God's presence, the situation that caused their suffering to begin, begin with doesn't change anyway. And what they've done by rejecting God is that they've removed the greatest source for hope and healing and help and comfort and strength that could possibly be available to them. Immaculate survived Rwanda. When asked if she hates those who killed her family, she says this, I knew that my heart and mind would always be tempted to feel anger, to find blame and hate. But I resolved that when the negative feelings came upon me, I wouldn't wait for them to grow or fester. I would always turn immediately to the source of all true power. I would turn to God and let his love and forgiveness protect and save me. Will you pray with me? Holy Father, we are grateful for this world you've given us. We thank you for our freedom, for our dominion. And when we misuse our freedom, we know that you grieve because someone will be hurt. One or many of your precious children will be hurt. Help us, loving and constant God, to use our dominion wisely, to practice kindness, to love you and one another with courage and with consistency. In Jesus' name, amen.